Welcome back, forensic students. I believe this is the last lesson in our unit. Let me check and make sure before I tell you. Yes, so this is it. We're at the end of the unit, um, and today we're talking about from the crime scene to the courtroom. So we have talked about crime scene processes, investigation, evidence that's found at the crime scene. And now we're going to talk more about the judicial side of things, which is when evidence finally gets to the courtroom. So uh, just some background knowledge, the U.S. Constitution, it was signed in 1787. And the Constitution set up the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the United States government. And then two years later, Congress added 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. And these 10 amendments are called the Bill of Rights. So you might be thinking, why in the world are you teaching a U.S. history lesson? I thought this was forensics. Um, but it's important to know because it has shaped forensics, specifically evidence being used in court. So we are focusing not on the entire Bill of Rights, but on one specific, specific article. So Article 6 um, of the Bill of Rights says that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and the district wherein the crime was committed. Uh, and so basically what that ensures all citizens, U.S. citizens, is that a person will be tried by an impartial jury. Um, and it is a selection of United, fellow United States citizens. And the purpose of the jury is to listen to arguments by both sides, the defense and the prosecution, and to hear information about physical and circumstantial evidence in the case. They also will hear testimony from witnesses, and then they will help make a decision about the guilt or innocent of the person that is accused. Now, the jury uses information that has been collected from investigators and put together uh, to make an informed decision about the guilt or innocence of the person on trial. Uh, remember, the jury is instructed to assume that the defendant is innocent until proven guilty proven guilty with scientific evidence. So this is just a quick little question I want you to ponder upon. Um, do you think that jurors follow these instructions 100% of the time? And can you think of an example of when jurors did follow these instructions or did not follow these instructions? So can you think of any case study that we've talked about this year or you've studied on your own where that wasn't necessarily the case? All right, so if you are in my class, you are going to complete the Real Life Forensics case study worksheet about the Casey Anthony trial. So Casey Anthony was the mom of Kaylee Anthony, who was two years old when she was found dead in a wooded area. Um, they never did find out who killed Kay Kaylee Anthony. Um, the mom was exonerated of all charges um, and they did do a full a full blown trial and she was proven not guilty. Uh, and so if you are in my class, you're going to do some research first and then come back and watch the rest of the video. If you are not, I'd like for you to pause the video. If you're not familiar with the Casey Anthony or Kaylee Anthony case, do a quick search of that. It is a very interesting case. It tends to um, get people in heated debates. I know when I talk about this with my students, this tends to be like something that just fuels people when they talk about this case, um, because it does seem that there is a lot of evidence that points to Casey Anthony's guilt. However, um, she did get a fair trial, and the jury just determined that the evidence was not sufficient to convict her. So, um, that is that is our judicial system um, and is as fair as it can be um, for most cases. Not all. All right, so once you've researched that case, come back to us. Um, as forensic science has continued to evolve, the following processes have been on the receiving end of scrutiny. So how evidence is processed, is that the best that it can be? A lot of people say no. 
um, what type of evidence is admissible or not admissible in court. A lot of people say this is a flawed part of our system. Equipment used to analyze data. Um, is it scientific or not? Should it be allowed in court if it's not scientific? Specifically, um, the lie detector test. Who can testify as an expert witness in court? What makes an expert an expert? Do they have to be on the job for 10 or more years, 20 or more years? Um, so there's lots of questions that surround um, different processes that are allowed or not allowed in the courtroom. All right, so Fry versus United States and Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals are two very influential cases that resulted in major changes in the field of forensics. So I want you to pause the video um, in just a second. Let me tell you what I want you to do. I want you to conduct research over these cases and complete this Venn diagram. So I want you to compare and contrast the Daubert we go back. The Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals case and Fry versus United States case. And then I want you to try to figure out the similarities and differences between the two cases and why they are influential in the field of forensics. What about them um, change sort of how we uh, allow evidence to enter the courtroom or expert testimony um, to enter the courtroom. Now, let me warn you, when you conduct research, you're going to see a lot of judicial jargon, which if you have not gone to law school might seem a little intimidating. That's okay. Um, just try to sort through best you can, complete that Venn diagram, and then come back and finish the video. All right now, there are more differences and similarities than what I have on the screen, but these are just some high points that I want to make sure that I point out. Um, I actually showed this to my best friend who is an attorney. <laughs> she was like, um, I said, is, does this look right? And she was like, um, if you're a middle or high school student that has no intention of um, going to law school, it's fine. Um, it gets the job done, and, but she was kind of laughed about it. She said it's very watered down. So if you want to do more extensive research, feel free. But this is what I need you to know with regards to forensics. All right, so let's start with the Fry standard. So it originated with the case Fry versus United States, and its focus is on the lie detector test and its admissibility in court. So uh, it states that evidence has to be accepted by the scientific community before it can be admitted into court. So because they did a deep dive into the lie detector and its significance in um, the scientific community, is it really a scientific tool that measures accurately? Because they did a deep dive into that, what came from that is a broad statement. So from the Fry versus United States case, now um, the judicial system says that in order for evidence to be admitted into court or presented, it has to be accepted by the scientific community. It has to be scientific. Um, and the whole focus is on evidence. So the Fry standard relates to evidence. Now, on the other side of that, you have the Daubert ruling. So it originated in 1993 with the Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals case. What came from that is a ruling that allows the trial judge to make the ultimate decision regarding expert testimony. So who is allowed to come into the courtroom and testify as an expert? So whereas the Fry standard deals with evidence, the Daubert ruling deals with expert witnesses, people. Now, both are standards that govern what is allowed in the courtroom, what is admissible in court. Both must be accepted by science, and both recognize that science constantly changes, and they are willing to adapt to those changes. So in a nutshell, that is the difference between Fry versus Daubert. 
All right, so the Daubert ruling paved the way for the use of expert witnesses in criminal proceedings. So if we're going back to the Casey Anthony trial, if you've done research, you may have come across an expert that was allowed to testify about the smell of decomposition in the trunk of the defendant's car. So just a backstory on this case, Casey Anthony, um, the prosecution brought forth an expert, and I'm doing air quotes there, an expert um, that testified that he but he had invented something called a smell detector and he put the smell detector in the trunk of Casey Anthony's car and it detected human decomposition. And so they were allowed to bring that into court and then it caused an uproar. Is that really scientific? In the end, the um, judge decided to throw that out. He said that this is not acceptable. This is not scientific. And so that that was to be thrown out. The problem was, is it had already been presented. And I've got a link there. I'm, I can't play the video um, live for you, but if you want to go to that video, you can see sort of a snippet of that court case. Now, additionally, there was a hair expert that was called as an expert expert witness in the case. Um, and he was allowed to present. He was um, accepted as an expert in his field. He had many cases behind him. He had many years of research in the field. Um, and so he was allowed to present his findings. And again, if you want to go to the video clip that I've linked here, um, you can just write that down and type that in. You're welcome to, but it's just a snippet of the court case and the guy who is testifying um, as to the hair mass that was found in the trunk of Casey Anthony's car, which they determined was Kaylee Anthony's. All right, to end, I just want to go over some different um, terms that you may see and you need to know or be familiar with with regards to court proceedings. So let's say you have a suspect that's arrested um, and then you have an arraignment. After the arraignment, you have what's called discovery. So during the discovery process, a plea, that's just say a plea deal is offered. If that plea deal is offered and accepted, then it goes straight to conviction by a judge and sentencing by a judge. If during discovery, they determine that the case needs to go full trial, you'll have a preliminary hearing. If during that preliminary hearing, the judge says there's not enough evidence in this case, then the suspect is just released. And that's the end. If there is enough evidence in the case, then the preliminary hearing goes to trial. This does not happen overnight. It does not happen quickly. Sometimes it takes years. I have been following the Tara Grinstead case because I'm from Georgia and Osceola is just a stone's throw away from me. And so I remember when that teacher went missing um, and I have been following her case. They, they have arrested um, 20 years later, they have arrested two guys in connection with her murder, and um, they were arrested like two years ago, but they still um, have not made it to trial. So we're awaiting that trial. All right, so after trial, the jury listens to both the prosecution and the defense, and then they do what's called deliberation, um, and then a conviction will be issued, or there will be an acquittal. Um, and if there's an acquittal, they can't decide, then the defendant is released, and that's it. Um, if there is a conviction, then, of course, they're sentencing later. Now, conviction and sentencing does not mean that that's the end of the case because our judicial system offers what's called an appeals process. So with an attorney, convicted individuals can appeal. Um, and sometimes that works out, and sometimes it does not. But these are just some terms that I feel like you should know. Um, and that ends our first unit in forensics.